Hello, everybody. I hope that uh, everybody around the world is doing very well. Uh, I myself am very, very excited uh, to be facilitating this much needed discussion. Uh, welcome to a very, very important keynote. Um, each community week, we always look for subjects and issues to tackle head on uh, and you know, provide a, a really nice space for the community to come together and discuss things that affect us all. Uh, this time, we wanted to focus on an issue which we think is uh, vital to discuss, and that is how we care for our students and ourselves in a seemingly ever-increasingly violent world. And I say seemingly, uh, deliberately that, a seemingly ever-increasingly violent world. So today we're exposed to um, coverage and footage and news of uh, so much more violence and danger than I think the generations immediately before us. And it's clear that it's having a profound uh, impact on the, uh, the mental health and well-being of ourselves and our students. So I would like to invite uh, three uh, of our panelists to the stage, each of whom have a, a really unique perspective on the subject and who can really help unpack it and explore it. Um, it's an important subject, and I would recommend that uh, everybody shares their thoughts and their ideas in the chat. Uh, and, and also across social media as well. Um, you know, conversations like this are important and uh, they, they're rarer than they should be. So I think uh, everybody watching, take the opportunity to open your minds and, and, and hear these new perspectives. And if there are ideas that you, uh, you resonate with, please share them with the rest of the world because that's, that's how learning happens. So without further ado, I would uh, like to welcome Victoria Thompson, Ken Shelton and Sal Sanjava to the stage to discuss how we can create safe spaces in dangerous times. Hello, welcome everybody. How's it going, guys? Doing, doing great. Good. Good, doing well. Good now, to be um, here. now, we have a lot to cover uh, today, and I know that this is going to be a really, really powerful conversation, and I know that people are going to enjoy uh, watching and hearing a lot of things that they may be thinking but not talking actually articulated out, out loud, sometimes for the very first time. Uh, but before we begin, uh, I wanted to hand it over to Ken because uh, during the preparation for this, you did mention uh, 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 some thoughts that you had on the, the very phrase uh, safe space, which is in the title of this webinar. So I'd love you to share that with the with the audience. Yeah. So first of all, it's a privilege to be here with uh, Mizba, my brother and my sisters, Victoria and Sawson and um, and a truly global community. I was watching the chat and looking at all the different countries that are represented. So for those of you that are in Europe and uh, at points farther east or west of Europe, thank you for staying up late uh, to join us. And so to Mizba's point, you, you know, the title is Creating Safe Spaces in Dangerous Times. And uh, I think it's important for us to really start to interrogate the use of that phrase, safe spaces. I, I, I interrogate it very heavily in a lot of my uh, DEI workshops and my anti-racist and anti-bias workshops because the whole idea is this construct of a safe space. When somebody's using that phrase, there are several questions we should always consider and always ask. And if we're the ones using it, we should always consider and ask. And as a following is number one, um, how do you define safety and who is defining that safety? Who's centering the guidelines or the ethos, if you will, around what safety is? Uh, and as a facilitator or a speaker, uh, you cannot guarantee people's safety. Uh, safe spaces generally are not spaces that are conducive for meaningful dialogue or growth. I prefer to shift it to a brave space, which is why I use this poem titled An Invitation to Brave Space, because one of the things it does is it gives us a degree of grace, uh, space, and um, and latitude that that we all carry with us a, a, a what I say is the sum of the totality of our experiences. And when we enter a brave space, we acknowledge that there is no such thing as perfectionism. Uh, my favorite line in the poem is we have the right to start somewhere and continue to grow. And my second favorite line from that poem is we have a responsibility to examine what we think we know. And the whole idea is that you are deconstructing this mindset of my comfort is a priority over my growth. And so that's why I always encourage the shifting of safe space to brave space. And to that end, I also add that when it comes to schools and teachers that say that their classroom is a safe space, what I always encourage them to do is shift that terminology to it's a protective space. Because what you are doing is you're creating a, essentially an, an environment that is protective of the individuals that enter that environment. But once they leave that environment, again, you cannot guarantee their safety. And so that's why when I hear safe space, I always ask the question, safe for who? So, so for us, 
I would encourage everybody who's on this on this um, stream to really start to interrogate that because it, you know, brave spaces is how we learn together and how we grow together. And I'll leave you all with my final comment is the the line, the last two lines in that poem says, you know, um, that our space will not be perfect. We will not be perfect, but it will be our brave space together and we will work on it side by side. Thank you for making that distinction, Ken. I think it's a powerful one. We can see people in the chat already uh, quoting Brave Spaces. So uh, I, I, I do think that it's a more appropriate, uh, appropriate word to use. Um, and, and I think that what you're saying clearly resonates and, and definitely holds a very, very important part in the rest of the conversation as well. And uh, please feel free to bring, uh, I think that that element and that distinction is probably gonna come back again throughout the rest of the conversation. So please feel free to, to, to you know, bring that in just to add a bit of context. Um, today we are talking about a, a topic which is, is politicized. It is a, uh, a topic which gets people hot and fired up. And um, it's something which we've chosen to speak about because I do think that whether it is in the US or whether it's across the rest of the world, um, we are living in a seemingly more violent world. Uh, I know that just by opening up my, my Twitter uh, app, uh, within you know 20 seconds, I can be bombarded with some of the most horrific video footage of violence, and it's right there, and I'm exposed to it on a daily day, daily basis. I can block the accounts. I can tell Twitter what I'm not interested in, whatever. It doesn't matter. It just seems like we're more exposed to it than ever, and it also seems. And I don't know whether the acts of violence that are happening are more commonplace, but certainly our exposure to it is more commonplace. What I'd like to ask uh, uh, Salsan and then Victoria, and then if you would, Ken, uh, to, to kind of summarize, um, how can teachers across the US and across the rest of the world create supportive and empathetic learning environments that focus on, on healing and recovery after, uh, in the aftermath of, of some of these really traumatic and, and uh, tragic events? Um, to me, I think, first of all, marhaba, everybody, um, and, and I'm so excited to be here with this beautiful panel of people and with all of you today. And I think, to me, honestly, before we even talk about the aftermath, I think the biggest thing is that we need to stop operating in schools as if these things aren't happening, right? And I think what happens a lot of times is that we continue to do things as if they're not happening and we're not addressing the elephant in the room. And so many of our kids are walking into this space with this primarily on their mind and in their lived experiences, regardless of what part of the world you're in. These things are showing up in different ways in our communities. And so what does it look like for us to actually address these issues in the classroom so that we can create spaces for students to critically think about them and read the world and understand it in ways that, I mean, I always say, and this is like, really something that as educators, I don't know if we think about often enough is that we are crafting humans in our spaces every single day. And by crafting these humans, ultimately we're crafting societies. And so how do we craft humans that we know are able to go into the world and they're eventually going to be the people that are taking over and making so many of these decisions that are able to interact and understand why these things are happening and what is the root cause of these things that are taking place in our world. So I think that one of the things that schools and curriculum have to address is why these things are happening. How do we notice, name, and interrupt the things that are happening in our world, regardless of what they are? Because there's inequities at the root cause of so many of these different things. And as long as we are choosing not to address them, that's a very political statement in and of itself, right? So I think people often say like, there's no space for school in schools and in classrooms for these political conversations. When you're choosing not to address these conversations, you are making a political statement because you're saying that they're not important. And oftentimes these are things that are the receivers of much of this violence are often marginalized groups. And so we're not talking about a lot of those things either. Um, and so those are conversations where we're choosing not to highlight, elevate, or talk about ways that we can build the tools for students to really walk through the world, navigate it, even as, as civically engaged citizens of the world, how do they vote differently? How do they run for office, elected positions? How do they do all of these things that are impacting the world that we're living in so we're actually healing it and not just building empathy for kids to understand it? We shouldn't be experiencing these things. It's not normal, right? We have normalized violence. We have become desensitized to seeing violence in our social media feeds. And that's the violence that social media choose to chooses to elevate. So we're not even seeing everything, right? And we want to keep that in mind as well. That some stories are elevated while others are silenced. But how do we how do we actually navigate that? And how do we start to think about how do we shift that so it's something different? Because it's not there's nothing normal about it. There's nothing normal about the context that kids are living in. But as long as we're not addressing it and we're continuing to drill skills 
as part of a curriculum without teaching kids how to use those skills to actually engage and change their context and their world, then schools are not doing what they're meant to be doing. We're not preparing kids for a real world. We're preparing them to go into the world blindfolded, which is why we have these problems to begin with. So I, I, to me, I think before we even have a conversation about building empathy, we need to have a conversation about how do we get comfortable with being uncomfortable in schools, creating those brave spaces that Ken talked about in order to address these issues with authenticity and fidelity so that we can start to build a population of kids that can shift the status quo and make better decisions than what we're seeing today. And, and I think I, I think that's a, a brilliant answer. I'd love to I'd love to uh, jump on the you made a really interesting point about the politicization of of this entire issue. And I think that for, for me, for myself, I wanted to approach this conversation in, in the least political way possible. But I think that the point that you're trying to make is that that in of itself is a political statement. Uh, and and I'll, I'll come back to that in, in a moment because I think that's a really interesting um, thought. But uh, Victoria, I wanted to hear your opinion to sort of kick off your take on all this. Like um, we know that these things are happening, they happen regularly and we're more exposed to them than ever. Um, what steps do you believe that, that teachers can take and, and schools can take to create better environments for, for healing and recovery? Yeah. Um, so first I'll start by saying, hey, everyone. <laughs> I'm Victoria Thompson. Really excited. I'm so, to I'm sorry to interrupt. I'm so, I, no I, completely <laughs> skipped, I completely skipped over the introduction. So it's fine. thank awesome. you for saving me. <laughs> if, if they're watching, they probably know who we are. I'm, just a, I'm making that assumption. Shout yeah. out. <laughs> I'm so sorry, Victoria. Please continue. <laughs> no problem. Um, so hey, everyone. Victoria Thompson coming at you from um, Orlando, Florida. And uh, this topic is definitely very near and dear to my heart because I just want to throw it out there that I'm 20. I have been involved in four instances in schools where guns have been involved and there have been shootings involved. Over the eight-ish, seven and a half, eight-ish years that I have been a working adult outside of college, there have been four instances. And I want to talk about the first one and the last one in particular, because to me, what it boils down to is communication when it comes to having these conversations. In the first instance, there was a student, this is a middle school. This is a seventh grade child that brought a gun to school with the intent to shoot another child. This happened on a Friday afternoon. We did not find out until Saturday morning. So I'm getting ready to go to the beach with my friends. I'm hanging out. And then we get a school robo call that there was an incident on campus that happened pretty much after most people had left. Now, of course, we're all running around wondering what happened. It happened on a Friday. We're getting this communication on a Saturday. We're wondering what's going to happen when we walk into work on Monday. And even though I don't think that situation was handled um, the best for obvious reasons, if there's something on campus, I very strongly feel that we should be notified swiftly. That way we can make the best decisions for ourselves and our students. But what I did appreciate was there was a space to have that conversation, ask those questions, push back as to why we were not notified, ask what we could do as a community to move forward. That should have happened on the onset. However, there were conversations and we were able to at least come together as best as we could after we found out what happened. And although I do recognize and understand that they didn't have all the details on that Friday afternoon, we should we still should have been notified. And my school administration owns that and they respect that and they understand that. The last instance happened um, and there was another weapon on campus with a student with intent to do something um, potentially quite dangerous and we were not notified. The only reason that I know something happened was because uh, about seven policemen rolled into my office and said, you have to get out. No, no teacher notification, no student notification, nothing. Then we all get called into a meeting towards the end of the school day. And we are told that there was a weapon on campus. The weapon was confiscated. Again, I knew all this because I was seeing everything firsthand. I'm very fortunate that in these four instances, nobody got hurt physically. That's what I want to point out. Physically, nobody got hurt the emotional trauma, the mental racking, all of the conversations we were having, we were stunned. And I'm not saying we were stunned because we didn't think it could happen in our community. I think we're all at the point now where we recognize that anything can happen anywhere to a degree. But the fact that there was still no communication and that we weren't notified was huge. Then when I think about how my leadership in the last instance handled it, there was no communication no newsletter, no coming together meeting, no space for us to communicate and share our concerns, nothing. It was almost like it never happened. So when I view these challenges and also how we communicate them to our school communities, 
I think of three things. And these three things to me are communicate, empower, and support. And they don't necessarily need to be in any specific order, but there has to be communication of just what is going on because it's a very stressful and challenging situation to be in. You also are hoping to empower your school communities to speak up and say something, and especially students, if they see something, or maybe if an educator sees something. The first instance that I spoke about, teachers were commenting all day that the student was holding on his backpack a little too tight, but nobody felt safe enough to say anything because of the culture of the school and, and what was created there. So that's something from the leadership lens that needs to be looked at. That's nothing, I mean, we, we can influence that as educators, but leadership really needs to take a strong lead on that. And then what I also think of support, the lack of communication that, that is sometimes pervasive in school communities, it is dangerous. And it is disrespectful, just being completely honest, to everybody in the school community. So we need to be able to provide support. And if you don't have support, immediately find a way to see what you can do to have that. Because we don't want to be in a situation where people are physically safe, but mentally not safe or emotionally unsafe. We have to have safety on all facets. If we don't, we are not cultivating a safe school community or a brave school community. Hmm. Uh, Ken, any thoughts on on the on this on this uh, particular question? Yeah, I mean, they uh, both Austin and Victoria kind of captured it. Uh, not even kind of, they captured it brilliantly. I, I'll, I'll just add a couple of things. So, you know, when you think about our systems and our institutions, first of all, the uh, I will just say this, anybody who says don't get political, they don't understand that literally every institution that we have, not just in the US and uh, around globally, there is a political influence to it, no matter whether you see it or not. So it's the recognition that the um, common gaslighting tactic, which is called switch tracking, is to say don't get all political because that's used as a it's conversational terrorism. It's used as a way to deter and derail having the necessary dialogue. So that's the first part. The second part, when it comes to the whole idea around how we get consistent and constant messaging that, you know, I would even ask folks to start to interrogate the use of the word violence, because as Victoria brilliantly just shared and even Sawson shared, it is not limited to any physical damage. There's a lot that you don't see. And so for me, the whole idea is, what are we doing as an educational community that is aligned with an indigenous approach to our wellness? It is not the individual. Are we addressing the disease rather than responding to the symptoms? What are we doing to ensure community wellness? Because if you, if you approach it from a community perspective, then no needs are placed higher than, uh, you don't create a hierarchy of needs for one. Uh, and I'm intentionally not using a specific name when I'm referring to this. Um, but you don't create a hierarchy of needs. You look at it from a community perspective. Uh, and then also the whole idea around the dialogue. I, 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 always, I always ask the question, because I think it is important to pose here, that is aligned with both what Sawson and Victoria share. When, when adults are reticent or resistant to engage in the dialogue, my question is always, is it because you don't know how to or because you don't want to? Because the whole idea is if you don't want to, well, then I want to we're going to talk about it. If you don't know how to, then that goes back to the brave space. How do we create an ethos of which our voices are heard? They are honored. And we recognize that the violence is not limited to, for example, as as Victoria shared, a firearm on campus. The violence could be, you know, school based policies that reinforce conformity, compliance and coercion. It could be in the curriculum whose voices are centered, whose voices are excluded, whose voices are dismissed, what type of cultural erasure is going on. There, there, there's all of these things, and we end up seeing a manifestation of, of elements of trauma and violence manifest itself, usually in no small part to what is the ethos of the culture within our educational institutions. And so for me, it's the whole idea around recognizing that the dialogue is critical, and, and for us to develop what I always say are the conversational strategies to not allow it to be derailed or deterred with a common, trust me when I say this, a litany of gaslighting tactics. But the whole idea is that for me, if any one teacher is not healthy, then that means that their students are also not healthy. That means the school is not healthy. That means the district isn't healthy. And so for me, it's how are we, how do we look at you know, even in the context of what we're doing now, this is, you got a global community here. How do we look at embracing uh, elements of wellness uh, 
protection and safety, for lack of a better description, from a community perspective. Because I see folks from other countries on here. You know, my thing is how do how do let's let's dismantle the geographical barriers and how do we look at at ways in which we can gain a better understanding of the uh, the social conditions and the systems that we operate within and do it from a, a wellness perspective. Because then ultimately it aligns with what Victoria just shared. That becomes empowering. That becomes liberating. And quite frankly, it becomes more sustainable. Honestly. I'm just going to add really quick, it humanizes, right? Like there's so much fear in our world that leads to so much of this violence because we don't understand each other. There's so much criminalization of different bodies of people. So with that communication that Victoria talked about and all of that work that we're doing in the, in, to kind of to be proactive and not reactive to a lot of it, addressing the problem, you're humanizing people. And that's so necessary in our world today because there's so much fear around groups of people. Mm. Yeah, I mean, incredible answers, and as you can see from the uh, from the, the the audience reactions, there, I think that so much of what you're saying is hitting home, and we'd love to see more of those comments. We are displaying them on the screen because I think it's important to share those thoughts. Um, I think I did want to talk about the 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 political element of it, but I think um, I think you kind of did that, Ken. <laughs> I think that what 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 my my next question was really around like how do we have these these conversations with students and parents without triggering like a political sort of you know backlash and with just focusing on the on the recovery and having like a deeper conversation of that but i think that you you pretty much summed up very well there and everybody in the chat is also proving me wrong by saying education is political and uh and and you described that as 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 like a as gaslighting which it, it makes complete sense for me now so i'll try and change the nature of that conversation given that we've kind of already answered it so I'm from the UK and um, the last uh, school shooting, you would say, happened in Dunblane in 1996. Um, that, that was, gun, you know, guns were banned and, and that's it. So for us here at Wakelet, the first time that we were having conversations with educators in the US and they were saying, I can't, I can't talk on that day because we have an active shooter drill. Yep. Um, mm -hmm. Like it, it's like, it like blew our minds that that's something that educators and students have to go into school every single day, uh, worrying about and thinking about as a potential threat. And I bring that up because Salsan, you, you mentioned the idea of fear. So right now, like there's, you know, high schools and buildings, particularly high schools, are being architected and designed for violence. You know, I, 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 in preparation to this, I read about a high school in, uh, in Michigan, and it's designed to limit the impact of, a, of an active shooter, as in the very, in the very walls of, the, of the, the school are designed around violence, you know, curved corridors to, to, to obstruct line of sight, and making it very difficult for an active shooter to get cover, um, having lockers uh, in communal areas so that everybody can see who's at their lockers, bulletproof glass, all this crazy stuff. My question is, uh, and we'll start with you, Selson, what, what impact does that have on a, on a teacher and a student? Because in the UK, the thing that educators and students have to worry about before going into the classroom every day is like, oh my God, there's double math and there's this, and you know, it, it's, not as, <laughs> it's not as significant or serious as the actual threat of a, an active shooter killing people. So I want, I want you to kind of share your thoughts on that, please, Selson, and then we'll, we'll go through the rest of the, the panelists. I don't, I, my stance has always been my stance, and for people who have heard me talk on Wakelet before on other platforms, I, I mean, there's reports that allude to the idea that many of the school shooters are people who are socially and emotionally unhealthy. And that is one of the biggest issues that we have. The mental health and social emotional health is something that we still don't talk about. And, and I know that when we came back from COVID, teachers were tasked with meeting students' social emotional needs, and nobody was given tools to do that. Like, how do you even, where do you even start? Like, it's another one of those things that became evident in the needs of our community, but teachers were, and it was another hat teachers were asked to wear without being given proper tools to do it. Um, so I think, obviously, when we think about curriculum, and I want to say this too, like, yes, this is the way that violence has kind of erupted in the United States, but as a global teacher who's taught in several different countries, curriculum violence is something that exists in so many different countries, and it shows up in different ways. As Ken mentioned in the pre-conversation that we were having, 
settler colonial countries. I'm Palestinian. Kids in Palestine are also surrounded by violence in different ways. They have to worry about bombs being thrown over their heads in the places that they're sitting in too, and they have to think about those things. Um, when we look at different countries and different places, there's violence happening physically, and there's curriculum violence that's happening where people are colonized through their curriculum and other kids are being silenced. Like I did a a little bit of a research on, you know, just the number of, of kids all over the all over the world who like hijabi girls who are having their hijab pulled off because that's something that's unacceptable in their context, whether it's in European countries or in, in American here in America or like in different countries, it's this is something that's happening as well. That's a form of violence. That hijabi girls are being asked to walk around in schools and wonder if they're safe wearing, dressing their religion wearing their religious clothing or not. Um, in other places it's it has to do with skin color. Colorism is a real thing in different places. So it's 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 more global than just the United States, but unfortunately in the United States, it's become a physical thing that we actually have to prepare for, like you mentioned earlier. And so to me, the root of all of these problems, no matter how it's showing up or what the core of it is in your school or in the country that you're, you're living in, is through curriculum, it's through education, right? Education is what heals, education is what creates humanity, it kind of invites the humanity that we've kind of lost in all of this back into the space. It gives people the opportunity to understand each other instead of fearing each other. I always tell my students, whenever fear is elevated, rationale is diminished. People are not thinking rationally, their fear is driving everything. And that's what causes these situations to happen. So when we can eliminate the fear, and the only way to eliminate it is by understanding each other, then we can start to bring back that rationale and people can think more clearly and on a human level. And so how do we do that? How do we how do we change the curriculum so that students are able to really understand across globe, the globe, across these lines, these borders, each other? How can we understand global issues? How can we also question the things that we see, the fake news and all of the things that are being publicized because we know that that's contributing to a single story in a lot of ways. And so people are pushing back against the personas of the way that, like I always say, I'm not what they want me to be in a lot of ways because I don't fit any of the stereotypes that the intersections of my identity are 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 attached to the stigmas that are attached to the intersections of my identity. I don't fit them. And so in a lot of spaces when I walk into educational spaces and I'm speaking, people are really surprised to hear the stories that I bring to the table. People are surprised to hear my experiences because of the stereotypes that have been created in curriculum, in the media, and all of those other places. So when people see me, and I've had students call me a terrorist. I've had parents tell me that my educators, my, my administrator last year told me that my identity was offensive, my Palestinian identity was offensive and asked me to tone it down. So when these are the personas that we're, these ideas are bringing into the table and educators who are shaping curriculum and interacting with kids. And it's a fact that teachers and educators spend more time with students than some of their parents do. And so we are shaping their identity, their self-concept is being shaped in school. When your self-concept is not there because everything that you are is what we tell you you shouldn't be, then that's contributing to a social emotional problem. It's contributing, it's equity based, right? When we talk about social emotional health, we talk about equity, we talk about differentiation, we talk about all these things that we deem best practices universally in education. The root of it is all equity. It's all tied together with equity. When we are seeing students and allowing them to be themselves and allowing them, like one of the things that I do in my class is my kids journal every single day for 10 minutes. And one of their prompts is, I wish my teacher knew. It gives them the opportunity to talk to me about whatever they want to talk about if they're facing something. If you're feeling like you're a misfit in school and it becomes it comes to a point where you're thinking of actively hurting other people, we have to create space for kids to feel comfortable enough to come and ask for help when they need it. These are kids who are crying out for help in a lot of different ways. Where are we creating opportunities for them to actually seek that help and get the help that they need? If you're going through something at home, a, term, a parent with a terminal illness, a broken family, whatever it is that these kids are dealing with in other parts of the world, you just watch somebody die in front of you with, with or there was just a, a bombing or a massacre or a genocide or all of these things that are happening in our world today. Even if you're not living there, United States has one of the largest refugee populations where we're bringing these kids in. What are we doing to heal them or to help them heal, right? We're dealing with all of these things. And when they foment in ways that are traumatic and the, the result of it is something that is violent, we're all surprised, but we have done nothing to, to, to support these kids in feeling like they can come to the table and have a support system yeah. to do these things. Yeah. So, and, uh, really a lot of it. Sorry. Sorry, Victoria, you, you, you mentioned during those experiences that you had that, you know, there was the, the, the psychological trauma Mm -hmm. And when surrounded by this, this, these constant, these constant elements, like what Salsan is talking about, what I started this question up with, what, what effect have you seen that have 
on students and educators and how, how, what tips can you give teachers uh, across the world? Because Salsan very rightly said that this is not, it's not just an American issue. There, is, there, right. are, there are students and teachers across the world who are dealing with traumatic, um, you know, countries that are at war. We see that every day. Uh, what effect does that have and how can we help? Mm -hmm. So first I want to apologize. My, my dog has decided to join this conversation. So Ren is here. He's here. Um, but it's actually kind of poignant because he's here because it started storming again in central Florida. And if you have animals or if you have a dog, you might know that sometimes when there's thunder, they don't feel safe. And typically in an unsafe situation, they'll go to the people or the things that comfort them the most. And right now I'm the only person in this house. <laughs> so he came on my lap because he is terrified right now. I don't know if you can see, but he's shaking a little bit. We moved here about seven months ago. So he's, he's getting better about the storms, but he still needs comfort. He's a he welcome needs to guest. be around his people. So I view all of this the same exact way. In times of crisis and in times of challenge, we look for our people and we look for sources of comfort. Sometimes those sources of comfort can unfortunately be more vice-like where they might make us feel good at the time. And then later on, we think and we look and say, hmm, that, that wasn't exactly the best decision. Or, hey, maybe I was in, like acting in the best interest of myself, but I wasn't acting in the best interest of my school community. Um, but some of these comfort situations or maybe even ways that we interact with each other and find our people, we can also find healing in that as well. Um, so ways that I like to initially have these conversations is really starting out by saying that baby steps are still steps and you are going to make mistakes along the way. It is not going to be perfect right out of the gate and that is okay. I cannot tell you in the past how many administrators I've spoken with where they are just heartbroken about what has happened and they're throwing 50 million things at the ceiling in order to see what sticks. We don't need 50 million things. We, we need to have a discussion about what is going to work for us, what actually happened within the confines of privacy, because sometimes there are things we, we can't know, right, because of making sure that students are safe, making sure that families are safe. There are some things that are pretty off limits, but for the things that are on limits, what can we discuss and, and how can we reach a, a point of being in an equilibrium state? It, it might not be 100%. But we can still be at the place where we can at least conduct these conversations and have them. Um, so a lot of these initial conversations I have begin with what happened from various perspectives. If you are sitting in the front office, it might look different from what's happening when you're a student in the classroom versus if you are a teacher in the classroom versus if you are a school leader versus if you are a family member. Families are a very large part of this conversation as well because it impacts the school community at large. Families are part of that community. So first speaking and thinking about what happens, this is a really nice place to start because we are not making assumptions. When you make assumptions about what you think people experience in times of crisis and challenge, you are already setting yourself up for shaky foundation. And you don't want to build a home on shaky foundation. So we are, we're not making assumptions. We're having a dialogue. After we have the dialogue, I like to map it up into actionable steps, things that we can take care of right now. Things that we can implement right now. And right now is, is a little subjective. It, it might happen in five minutes. It might happen this week. We could start to implement it today. But at any rate, it's not going to be a delayed response because we have the resources, the tools, and the technologies to let it happen currently. So one of the things that I implemented, um, and, and I did it for a couple of different things, but I just did staff shout outs because we needed to have a way to make people feel recognized and feel good in a time of crisis and in a time of challenge. So I actually set up just like a quick form online and it was something that you could give a shout out anonymously to a faculty, colleague, staff member, just anybody in the building that you thought was doing a rocking job that week. They would submit them to me every Friday. I would hand send them out every Monday. They were anonymous. I'd put them in like a PowerPoint, send it out to the distribution list. That way they started out their Monday with some good news. It did wonders for morale. And I started that before a lot of this started happening in the school, um, um, in the school community. But I found that once these times came up, it just made things seem so much more community focused and driven because in the midst of the chaos, we see you. That was the message that was given. In the midst of everything going around, we see you. And that's not to say that they're thriving through the chaos, but it's to say, in spite of, or you are still doing good and we recognize you. We are doing the best that we can on our end to mitigate these discussions and these challenges, but we're also saying this is a both and situation mm -hmm. where, where we are still recognizing you and we are seeing you. 
Um, then after the immediate, then we can kind of go into what needs to be happened that might need a little bit more attention from other folks, whether it involves district people, funding. Um, I saw something in the comments where somehow money is around, but it doesn't seem to go to where it needs to be. So, yeah. so, so sometimes we need to figure out is it not going where it needs to be because they just don't have it? And the answer is usually no. It's because they make money, they make time and money for things that are a priority for them. And mm -hmm. sometimes this is just straight up not a priority. I'm going to be very honest. That's why we sometimes have money for private policemen, but we don't have money for mental health and crisis counselors or school counselors in school. In the last school that I worked at of over 600 students, there were two school counselors, one for grades six through eight, one for grades nine through 12. And I, I know a lot of other schools that are also in the same boat or even in worse of a boat because there could be a thousand students with one counselor but right. at any rate um figure out what needs to be done and fight for it right. Right. try to fight as best as you can you might not get what you want but the worst that anybody could say to you is no so I'm a big believer in fight, 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 because even if it doesn't turn out as you anticipated, people at least know what you're thinking. And then you can begin to make moves to figure out what the next game plan is. Yeah, I think that's a really empowering message for the educators to hear. Um, so, Ken, we, we, we've heard from Salsan about the importance of the, the curriculum and from Victoria, the importance of, of community and making sure that there's that really nice, thriving community in, in the schools to help with this. I'd love to hear what your thoughts are before we move on to the, the, the next uh, subject. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to bring up several things. So I put some chats, excuse me, I put some uh, things in the chat. So that was, those are derived from uh, a post that I, I did on Facebook on my birthday. Um, and I, I want to highlight uh, all three of them because they literally, as as Sasson and Victoria are, are speaking, I I literally was like, oh, I I'm going to share a a a, a quote. Now, I'm quoting myself, but it's really a thought that I had, and it connects to all of this. And I'm going to share something as well, real quick. So one I put was, uh, people who purposely withhold love are not your people, but they are their problem. And the whole idea around that is to recognize the importance of uh, again collective health community wellness, um, and, and, and love can be defined in many, many, many different ways. Like I, I love my esteemed panelists here and they know this, but here's the key uh, why I mentioned that, because one of the other things I put was it's important to let people know when you're thinking of them. How often do you do that? How often do we do that? It doesn't matter where we are geographically. I have other friends, other, other educators in other parts of the world. When I'm thinking of them, I text them, I email them, I do whatever. Hey, I just want you to know I'm thinking of you. It's that whole affirmation. What could potentially happen when you think about it and you extrapolate that to an entire classroom, an entire school, or an entire district? And so the whole idea around the prioritization of resources, both financial and human, one of the things that I, I tend to challenge site administrators and district leadership around is if you want to support educators in acknowledging and highlighting things that kids are doing, how are you ensuring that they have the time and the space to do that? If you say send an email, but do it after your contracted hours, and that tells me it's not a priority to you. That's one example of it. The other one that I shared uh, was, um, where is it? Yeah, uh, that, that one, there was another one that I had. Just about, because, but, just because, just because something isn't for you doesn't mean that. Well, yeah, just, it's important to let people know when you're thinking of them. But, but also going back to the whole uh, wellness thing. So a friend of mine, Mandy Freilich, she and I have done a lot of, um, uh, of adult SEL workshops. And she taught me this phrase called the wounded healer. Because the whole idea around the wounded healer is if I'm an educator or I'm an adult, if I have not healed myself, then I am not in a position to be a healer for others. And the whole idea is how do we prioritize ourselves, recognizing that a lot of the messaging that we receive in education is your only value is how much time you spend doing for others. And Victoria, I remember, I never forget this because Victoria and I had a conversation and I remember she specifically said to me, you can't pour from an empty cup. And so for me, I remember when, that conversation. I always listen to my peeps, but, but the whole idea of this, this concept of the wounded healer is how have I prioritized healing myself? Then I'm in a position to support being a healer for others. And, and if we are not whole, then we cannot do that for others. And so for me, 
when it comes to the whole community wellness thing and being able to navigate the politics around it, the trauma that is embedded within the curriculum that is on our social media feeds, that is in the culture of many of our, or the ethos of many of our school systems, uh, that is part of our social condition. It's like all of us are carrying something in that invisible knapsack that we walk around with every day and into our learning spaces. What are we doing to ensure that that isn't, uh, that, that, that what's most in that knapsack isn't the harm, the wounds, and the trauma that we are still consistently and constantly navigating. And, and my final comment for this is the whole idea around when you approach it from a neuroscience and cognitive perspective, if you are in survival mode, that is what your brain prioritizes. It, it prioritizes that. So it is unrealistic. And quite frankly, I, I, I always say it's you're, you're buying fool's gold if you think that you are in a position to do your job, the essential function of your job at your best, and students are in a position to learn at their best if you are constantly navigating spaces of which you have to survive. It's not possible. It is cognitively not possible. So that's why I go back to those quotes, because my whole thing is for, for everyone on here, like, if you're thinking of a friend or a colleague, met, let them know you're thinking of them. It doesn't have to be a formalized structure. It could just be simply, hey, I'm thinking of you. That's it. Just that whole affirmation. And that's something that I challenge teachers to do with students around the whole idea of, hey, if you've got a classmate that you you're just if you're thinking of them and you got some. Hey, I'm just thinking of you. Sometimes it's just that that the affirmation that you're seen and heard. And that's why I always say our learning by just seen, heard and loved. That's it. That's all we need. Mm -hmm. You can address all the other things after those three parts are met. And, and my final comment is uh, it, all of this reminds me of a quote that I share, it's, uh, it's from the Maasai tribe, in, uh, um, and the quote is, Aseri on the Kera, which translates into English, and how are the children? Uh, how often do we even ask that question? Mm -hmm. yeah. If yeah, I can I just think... in on that real quick, Ms. Ba. Um, I saw something pop up um, from Alfredo Silva. Hey, Alfredo. Um, how his favorite phrase for me is um, exploitation of empathy. And I wanted to expand on that a little bit, because Ken hit the nail on the head, and exploitation of empathy, if I were to kind of boil it down, is really thinking about how when we look at what we do in social media, in our personal lives, the exploitation of empathy is the ability to understand and share the feelings of another person or being. So that's empathy. The definition of exploitation is kind of the act or the fact of treating somebody unfairly. So exploitation of empathy is leveraging someone's emotions, attitude, or well-being for benefit or gain. And sometimes we get into those spaces when we're operating out of fear, operating out of anger, operating in unsafe situations. And it happens all the time, all the time. And going back to what we've been talking about, we need to heal ourselves and figure out what we need to do to heal, but also ask others what they need in order to heal, in order for us to have not only constructive conversations, but whole communities. Because as I said, you can't build on shaky foundation because otherwise you're going to have a house that falls apart. We don't want a house that falls apart. We, we, want, we want a house that is strong and a house that is able to hold a lot of people and not only hold a lot of people, but make sure that they thrive within it. I'm going to add to that too. And I'm going to say that it's also like, we're talking about some of the adults, which is so important, but it's also about like asking the community what they need instead of the people who are in charge, the gatekeepers in the schools, deciding what we think the, the community needs. So actively engaging the community in that conversation, including the kids in the community who, if they're given space, will share so much. Yeah, some, some honestly, some great, some great thoughts there. I loved, I loved what um, Ken was saying, which I think is kind of uh, very similar to what everybody's saying in, in the sense that a lot of the time people are just surviving and it's really difficult to, to kind of keep adding things on top without at first fixing things from the root. Um, so I think that that's one thing that a lot of teachers will, will, will take with them and, and look at their classrooms a little bit differently because they're dealing with students and colleagues who, you know, I think one of the things that, that one of the things which is important to remember is that people have their own problems. People are trying to uh, pull themselves up and pick themselves up every single step of the way. And then on top of that, you have all of these things around the periphery, right? Things that people are putting on top of you to try and like, um, you know, reach a certain outcome. So I loved, I'm waffling a little bit, but I, I hope that people understand the thing which I'm trying to get to. Um, I wanted to, to uh, kind of shift the discussion just a touch because we're, we've got 50 minutes left. How, how, how crazy is that? <laughs> we've, we've maybe gone through like two, three questions, but I love it. 
Um, so I wanted to shift the focus over to something that I think is, is really just as important as the, 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 the other things that we've been thinking about and talking about, and that is the, the media impact on all of this, you know? Uh, social media, uh, legacy media, they really do play a really important part in fueling the anxieties that, you know, students have over a, a big, wide variety, uh, range of, variety and range of issues, um, including school violence. So this coverage is often really, really sens sensationalized. How do we better equip students to interface with the media in general? And I'm not just talking about social media, I'm talking about legacy media. How do we help students understand that there are media biases, that there are differences in the different places where you source your media from? Um, I, I think that that's a really big part of it. Um, I'd, love to, I'd love to hear from you, Ken, first, because it looks like you're enthusiastically waiting to make a point on this. <laughs> you just affirmed why I stress the critical and urgent importance of incorporating media literacy throughout the curriculum. Media literacy, you li listen, my whole thing is when I hear a focus on literacy, I always ask, first of all, how do you define it? Uh, and so for the audience, I define literacy in five dimensions, reading, writing, speaking, listening, and observing. So I'm starting off with that. Now, what you just talked about is the importance of media literacy. It's being able to discern misinformation, disinformation, and malinformation. It's also recognizing that media is, you know, to quote Malcolm X, media is the most powerful entity on, on, on the earth. It can shape the minds of the masses. There is a reason why certain messaging is prioritized in media. There's the, uh, you know, there's, a, there's an old saying in journalism, if it bleeds, it leads. Because this whole idea around this, this constant barrage of, of, of trauma, of violence, of, of, of destruction, of all of these things, it changes the chemistry up here, by the way. And so for me, it's recognizing and incorporating elements of why, why, do, my, why do my social media algorithms prioritize things that I tend to gravitate towards over my entire feed? It's the confirmation bias part. It's the I'm going to consistently and constantly go back. It becomes this vicious cycle of I, I, I want to see the train wreck uh, or the dumpster fire, but I don't really, I just want to see it at one time, but then I'm going to see it again and I'm going to see it again. It's how we become desensitized in general to a lot of those things. And it's hard enough for adults to navigate that, but now you have a, a, a child where one, their frontal lobe is not fully developed until usually around the age of 24. But then also they don't have the lived experience to be able to navigate and contextualize the messaging I'm receiving. And of course, as Sawson mentioned a while ago, historically, the media has not presented a favorable or affirming message for those of us that are of a historically excluded and marginalized identity. And so the whole idea around it is to be able to recognize and acknowledge that the messaging uh, frames and shapes a lot of what we think, what we see, and what we do. And so for us, it's really the critical importance of embedding media literacy across everything that, that occurs in our entire school systems globally. I cannot stress it enough. I don't have enough time to go hardcore into it, but, but that's my main point around that is media literacy. You can't, if you're, if you're not incorporating media literacy into your curriculum, then you are denying both yourself and your students an opportunity to really be able to navigate the society that we have to operate within. Mm -hmm. Period. I'd also like to add, too, that media literacy and literacy is every single person's responsibility. I come from the STEM world. I taught fifth and sixth grade math and science. I was a STEM coach. I was a STEM instructional leader. And I can't tell you how many times I work with science and math teachers or engineering teachers that said, well, I don't really have to worry about that because the ELA teacher will take care of that. Or I don't really have to worry about that because the media specialist will take care of that. And then they are so mad when a research paper comes to them and it's not fact-checked, there's no bibliography, they are getting all of their resources from, from sources that aren't vetted, they're taking small clips, or my personal favorite, they're getting to the very end and they're writing Google as where they got all their references from, right? So when I think about what media literacy looks like, is of course more than just turning in assignments and, 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 and conducting yourself well in class, but we can do this in every single one of our spaces in classrooms and also in schools. It shouldn't just be a point of having it be in the media center or in the ELA class or the humanities class. It should be in every single, every single space because it impacts every single space.
I agree with all of that. And I'm going to say too, that I think I call it reading the world and it's giving the kids the opportunity to read the world. And when I work with schools and districts in writing curriculum and, and trend, like uh, reforming curriculum, one of the big, thing, big things that I always say is schools want to plan the whole curriculum in the summer for the entire year. And when you do that, you're not you're intentionally not allowing space for these conversations to come into the classrooms. And so being flexible enough that if there is something happening in the world and it is in the media, that we can actually bring that into the classroom and that becomes our text for the day. That becomes the conversation. That becomes the issue that we're discussing and journaling about or we're tying it into the theme. I think we're teaching skills and a lot of times we're wondering why kids are not mastering these skills and they're going into universities and there's still a gap in their learning. But when, we be, when these skills turn into life skills and kids can understand how, for example, the importance of rhetoric is in having these conversations about things that are happening in the world and shifting them, then all of a sudden the skill of rhetoric that I'm trying to teach my students or grammar, how to use a period or sentence structure and the importance of sentence structure in voice, right? All of these skills then become essential skills that are giving kids back power that we've historically taken away from them. And so how do we actually use the world and all the things that are happening as the, the most important source of curriculum so that we are teaching students how to use everything that we're teaching them in the classroom to engage with the world authentically, but also read it critically, which right. is something that they need to be doing. And the last thing for me is we also have to teach kids how to become content creators and not just content consumers. And that's a really, really big thing because whose voices are we hearing even in the media? And one of the things that I tell my students is take back your story, own it. How can you create outputs that you can share with the world to help them understand who you are, what your lived experiences are? And so I think it's not just about consuming media and understanding how to navigate it, but also understanding how to contribute and disrupt the media that's out there in order to include your story and some of the stuff that's being publicized and, and, and help to shift those single story narratives in that process. Mm. Yep. Uh, so many great answers there. Honestly, I'm just I've just been reading the chat and pinning. Uh, it looks like it looks like there are so many things that educators are resonating with. Uh, Ken, that I'm I'm loving your your comments on that as well. Um, please, everybody who's watching, you know, don't forget to share your thoughts and share your comments on online with us on Twitter as well, so that we can share and amplify them uh, on a slightly bigger platform. Um, but I wanted to I wanted to kind of keep on the the media bit just a little bit because I think that it links nicely onto something else, which is around like desensitization, like. One of the things that we find is that the more exposed we are to these stories, the more we exposed we are to this kind of footage, I find as in young people today, the more likely they are to kind of be become desensitized and used to it to the point that they completely lose empathy. Like they, they, they're just, when they're seeing people suffer, they're seeing it through the same screen that they play Angry Birds on. I don't think kids play Angry Birds nowadays anyway, I'm showing my age there. Uh, but, you know, it's it's very difficult, I found, I think, for some, for some young people, because they're being, you know, kind of force-fed this this algorithmic content, um, to find that empathy. I'd, I'd love to hear, hear, hear a little bit from uh, from you, Victoria, uh, on, on what, you know, what educators can do to kind of bring that empathy back up and say, look, these, th this person in this footage, this person is, you know, is a real person. Yeah. I'd like to start out, I'm trying to figure out how I want to phrase this, um, but I'm just going to say it. I'd like to start out by saying that there, we don't have to see everything all the time, always. And there are some things that it's okay to just say, this is not productive for me or my mental health and you shut it off. Um, when there was the issue, I mean, there's there are so many different things that have happened within the last two months <laughs> that whenever something comes up, I'm like, hmm, didn't that just happen? But there was something that happened where um, it was a student that brought a weapon to school in order to do something to a teacher um, that, that, that wasn't going to be a great thing. Thankfully, things stopped before it got too chaotic. But the video was still taken by another student and it began to circulate around the Internet. So I immediately saw that video, something I did not want to see, did not need to see, because remember, I've lived this four times and I've gotten four very close calls. So what I did was I looked through and I began to mute words and I began to mute phrases and I began to mute accounts that I knew were perpetuating this across social media. And then I put it on my social media. I'm like, hey, if you see this and if you don't want to see it, here are the steps to mute these words on Twitter, on Facebook, all this other stuff. So then a comment I got back was, well, well, it, be, it needs to be shown for the people that don't believe it, or it needs to be shown for the people that like, otherwise, if they didn't see video footage, they wouldn't think it would be true. Mm -hmm. Those are discussions I don't want to be having with people, because if you need to be in a situation where you need to see a video in order to believe somebody's lived experience that they're telling you, we're not even on the same wavelength to have a conversation. 
I'm just going to begin and end there. Um, so it's okay to back out from conversations if you feel like it's not going to be productive for you or your mental health, because you've got to keep yourself intact while all of this is going on. Some of these things are things that you don't want to see because you've lived it or you've experienced it yourself. Some of these things are so fresh for you, or maybe you're still learning and you don't feel like you can contribute to the conversation. So instead you just want to learn, but maybe learn differently and that's okay. But with the desensitization or desensitizing, these, I, I don't know how to pronounce it. Know with the media, right? Yeah, with what's going on with the media, there is so much that I think that's contributing to it. Because every time you look, it's all you see. And I very carefully curated what I see, not because I want to sterilize it, but because I want my feed to be a reflection of what I want to learn and also the person I want to be. And the person I want to be is not somebody who sees video upon video of police brutality or, or a student pepper spraying a teacher. Not that these aren't conversations that need to be had, but there are things where I can see it once instead of seeing it over and over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. So that's something I have taken to task with a lot of the teachers and the students that I work with. Um, they're suffering through a lot of stuff with quite frankly, media overload. And I see, ironically, uh, somebody in the comments saying that it can be media overload at times. So let's lessen that load a little. Ken, I'd love to hear your 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 thoughts on this. It looks like this is this has been the fastest hour of my life. So it looks like this is the last question. So if there's anything yeah, else that you want to bring into I'll it, I'll be brief so that Sawson has some time. I'm gonna put uh, I'm gonna put something in the chat, but I'll even say it is that you know if you go to if you point back to what we talked about around wellness and healing, uh, another quote from that Facebook post, and I'll put it in the chat. Sometimes healing means taking an honest look at the role you play in your own suffering. And that points to literally to what Victoria just shared is the whole idea around, I need to see it to believe it. That's why I said, when it comes to that, one of the questions I always ask is, okay, so what does that say about the proximity you spent to the, with those within those that have been harmed the most? What does that say about your own estimation and assessment of your empathy and compassion? And if your default is to deny the lived experience of others, then if you need to see it, then my follow-up questions are, what do you plan to do about it once you have seen it? Yeah. Like you can't have it both ways. It doesn't work that way. And, and my whole thing is like, you know, just be mindful of the fact that just because you need to see it doesn't mean that it isn't the lived experience of others. And again, if you haven't been in the proximity to understand that in many cases, when it comes to these types of harms, you know, my whole thing is we're not making this stuff up. Like, what do we, what, do, here's one, what do we stand to gain by making these things up? Like, what's, what, 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 like, seriously, what's the goal here? So for me, it's, you know, when, when I think about folks that are constantly sharing these things, and then I'm like, they're not well, again, it goes back to that quote. Sometimes healing also means you need to take an honest look at the role that you play in your own suffering. I think that's incredible, Ken. Sasan? Yeah, I feel like that's a great ending. I think I'm only going to say is that sometimes we assume that people should understand these things and know these things. Like we assume that people are able to engage in critical conversations without actually providing them with the tools. And so I think it's important for us to really have these conversations explicitly in spaces that we occupy, whether it's with adults or kids and just say, like I always ask my students, imagine this with somebody you loved. When we're circulating videos of police brutality, how does that impact the families of these of these victims, right? And when we're, when we're circulating things like school fights, how does that impact the people who are involved in those things? And so just having them center themselves and really think about that, I think building that empathy is something that we have to be more explicit about. So not being afraid to have explicit conversations about a lot of these difficult topics. And, and I think a lot of people say, well, you know, they're kids, they're experiencing it. And, you know, they're, they're living these experiences. If they're experiencing it, then we have to be able to dot our I's and cross our T's and have those conversations with them very explicitly. And from my experiences, I know that kids really appreciate it. They appreciate being spoken to like adults and learning how to navigate a lot of these things. And so do a lot of adults who are in spaces that are with us and we think that they can do these things as well. And I think we've all been socialized by the same system. So if we're not interrupting things, I always say deconstructing to reconstruct, right? That's what we have to do. We have to tear apart what we already know in order to build new understandings. That has to become something that we, we think about explicitly. So all of what they said, but I think that needs to be something that we actually talk about in schools and not just assume people know. 
Wow, incredible. I think, uh, I think this is once again, another one of those, those keynotes that really should be a long form podcast. And that could go on for like another, you know, three, four, five, six hours. Um, what I, what I will do is I, I do promise to the, the audience and everybody watching this, that this, this conversation will be continued. And I will make sure I am going to be chasing you, Ken, and Salsa and, and Victoria uh, to, to jump back on here at some point uh, uh, during this year uh, to continue this conversation, because I, I think that you are completely right. When, we, when I shared the questions for this, Salsa was like, I don't think we're going to have enough time. And you are 100% right. We managed to cover maybe three or four, but um, I, I, th there's so many more questions to talk about in this space. But the reason why I wanted to invite you all here was because each and every one of you has shared something that I know has been super impactful and changed the perspectives of the people watching, including myself, right from the very start. So I, I cannot thank you enough for continuing to be, um, you know, sources of, uh, of, of, of comfort and, and wisdom in this, in this community, for sharing your truth, for sharing the things that, um, you know, you have learned along your journeys, because I know that this community appreciates them more than anything. Uh, Ken, Salsan, Victoria, thank you so, so much for joining. Um, if you would like to just say a quick goodbye to, to the, the, the community, I think that they'd all appreciate it. And then we'll wrap it up super quick. I'll go last. <laughs> Victoria, how about you? I can go first because my dog keeps jumping up because he wants to say <laughs> goodbye to everybody. Um, but I just want to say thank you all so much for being here. Thank you, everyone participating. Um, special thanks to Sawson and Ken and Ms. Buff for letting us not only be here and share the space, but have real dialogue and not the sugarcoating dialogue. Um, just about our experiences, how we carry on and how we know that this work is not done. So that's what I'd like for everybody to leave with. This is continuous work and this, this work is not done. And one conversation is not going to, it might shift how we think internally, but it's not going to shift everything at large. So I'm excited to see not only continued conversations, but also what y'all learn from this, what you take and what you implement. 100%. And I'm going to say be bold. I always tell my students be bold. It's about time for education to be bolder and to really just kind of be fearless in making these changes. It, we have to. We it's, it's absolutely necessary. There's no other space in any of our countries that's going to be able to do this other than educational spaces. This is where the foundation and the foreground of who we are as people happens. And so we really need to be bold in embracing these conversations and doing the work to shift and heal our world. Thank you. Thank you, Salsa. Yeah, and I, I posted a comment. Much love to my sisters, Victoria and Salsa, here. And I also shared in the chat, uh, you know, my favorite Nipsey Hussle quote. If you look out the people in your circle and you don't get inspired, then you don't have a circle, you have a cage. For all of us, for our collective health, for our community growth, for our community healing, for appropriate and, and, and sustainable mechanisms of restoration, it is, it is critical for us to really look at the circles that we operate within and that we navigate and recognize that sometimes some people are not our people, but ideally in this context of community and what you've put together, what Wakelet has put together, this is part of our collective community. And my challenge to myself and everybody is how do we continue and make it sustainable, our community wellness, our community support and our community bro growth uh, so that we are truly a circle and not a cage. Mm -hmm. Incredible. Thank you all so much for another inspiring conversation. And like I said, I promise this community that we will we are con continually committed to, uh, to, to sharing these conversations and making them happen and using our platform to, uh, to, to change minds and perspectives and help our, our community deal with issues like this. So thank you so much, Ken. Thank you, Salsan. Thank you, Victoria. I'll see you all soon at ISTE. Bye-bye. Yeah, thanks. See you at ISTE. Bye. Bye-bye.